Yeah, great. Um, well, hello everyone, thanks for listening ahead of time. So, uh, just a very brief uh, context to, to designing games. I'm a theatre director, but um, have been to a lot of shows where I've been told that I'm going to have participatory agency, I'm going to be immersed in a world where I'm going to be able to influence what happens. Very rarely does it ever turn out that you really get to influence anything. You just essentially watch a performance, maybe hold a, an actor's hat or something like that. So I've kind of become interested in game design because I'm interested in how you actually drive participation or invite participation. And games are built on participation, so that's what I've been looking into. So I'm in the middle of designing a game which is called People vs. Democracy. And it's, uh, as you'll discover, it's a very complicated thing, complicated design. So I want to talk to you about it to sort of see to what extent it makes any sense what I'm trying to do. Uh, so basically, the kind of this finding idea of people versus democracy is that we get caught up uh, with the idea that elections are the big way that we influence the world and express power. But actually, arguably, power is a lot more complex. We influence the world every day with where we choose to work, what we choose to spend our money on, who we interact with, what media we read and consume, how we uh, affect opinions. So that's the basic intention of people versus democracy. So what I'm doing in this design is trying to kind of give a simulation of some of the structures and processes whereby power is expressed in the world. So this is a diagram of how the game is shaped in its design, and I'll try and talk to you very briefly how things interrelate. So energy. A lot of us require energy to live, to power our homes, to power businesses and industries. So one sector is energy. People who produce it and people who sell it. So think miners who uh, dig coal uh, for coal hard power plants or oil or whatever. We've got miners who sell energy. Energy then becomes important for food producers, so people who industrialize agriculture, uh, and then they give that food to supermarkets and they sell to us so we can eat it. Energy is also important for construction, so builders build houses that we need to live in. We all need to have a roof over our heads, so constructors need energy to build their houses and have industrialized construction. And then estate agents sell or rent property to us. So those are some three basic productive mechanisms whereby we produce things that drive the economy. Then we've got the state. As we all know, the state taxes these industries to generate revenue. Then it uses the revenue to provide education, healthcare, but also provide instruments of control like police and the judiciary and prisons. We then have what I've kind of called non-producers. Uh, try to be as non pejorative as I can. So for that, I'm thinking about people who perhaps are unemployed uh, or are actually criminals who try to take from other people rather than producing it themselves. Then we also have the media who produce representations of how this structure interrelates uh, and try to influence opinion. So the game, the way the game works is, if you guys were coming to play the game, ahead of coming to the game, you would be asked a bunch of questions. And based on those questions and sort of a profile of who you are, we would assign you a character avatar. So you might be given a character avatar like, okay, you are a miner, uh, so you work in the energy sector, you're a miner, and your objective in the world is to be able to buy a house. So let's say you're the miner. Here's what your journey in the game might look like. So you're dreaming of your house, that's what you really want. You go into the coal pit, you dig your coal, you get some money. But Mining can be really bad for your health, so you're coughing a wee bit. Then what do you need? You go to get health to kind of boost your health level um, because you've been trying to get money from your mining, but it's affecting your health. Then the healthcare centre, they say, well, maybe you don't have to work in the pit your whole life. Maybe you could go to school. So you go and get some schooling, and that enables you to get a high-tech job where you're earning double the number of bills. But then... What happens if there's no miners? Nobody taking the coal, no energy. Then, the food in the supermarkets is more expensive because if energy is more expensive, then the, uh, the, the food producers, it costs them more to produce their food, and it costs the builders more to construct their houses. So because it's costing more to build houses, miner dude, who's now a high-tech worker, still doesn't know how to get the house. So that's a really quick example of how some of these sectors interrelate. interrelate. Then, to create more complexity is what I've called in design terms a donut. So, as I say, with theatre, 
these immersive theatre events want to confer participatory agency to people, but they tend to prioritise telling a narrative. And when they prioritise telling a narrative or performing a narrative, it takes away the control that you as a participant have. So by designing games, I want people to have a free-flowing experience where they have control. They, they get to make decisions about how they pursue their objectives within this system. So the question about how to build a narrative into that is a tricky one. So within this social game, which functions very much like a social interactive game, we're going to have a digital system that monitors and measures the state of the game. And then based on how the game unfolds, for example, with a society becoming more unequal or more equal, or the state becoming bigger or the state becoming smaller, the computer system will measure where, uh, where things go and that will then trigger narrative events to occur. But crucially, the crucial contention that I'm making is that it's important for these narrative events not to be determined by a writer or a director having a predetermined idea of where a story should go, but fundamentally for these events to be based on what the players have done in their gameplay. So the decisions that they make within the gameplay determine what narrative events unfold. So, that's a very, very quick summary of what people versus democracy is in design terms. What I'm interested to find out and ask you a couple of questions of you are, first of all, how confusing is this? <laughs> how confusing is this? Yeah, is it a scale? <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, or just in terms of your automatic sense, how confusing is this? As a player, how confused do you think you might be if it's, you walk into it's this? It's not confusing as an idea, it's really interesting, but it's one of those things that you have to see in the practice to understand fully how, how it functions. Because uh, as an idea, when it immediately comes to a lot of crop, it'd be great to see if you had any idea of how it actually be put into practice. So, how would it practically work? That's your curiosity. I know the answer to that, but I'll, I'll keep going with the questions because they don't have much time. Anybody else want to talk about the confusion level or the complexity level? I don't know the purpose. What's the purpose? So the, pur well, the, the purpose of designing this game is to give people a uh, forum where they can actively consider some of the issues that relate to how they express power. And I think if people can play a game where they can have a, an opportunity to pursue their goals that they're given in the game, uh, and feel that they have the, the creative agency and volition to actually shape a societal outcome. They might just go back out into the real world and think that maybe they can shape society not just through who they vote for, but actually some of the choices they make on a day-to-day -day level. Does that answer the question? Sort of. This, this is a game. It is a game. So how do you win? So for what each is the aim of this? Because every game, they use, if participants, they use yeah. the top to win. What you explained was like what's the benefits mm -hmm. of playing the game you get, to yeah. awareness of this and this and that. So the goal for the game will be individual for each player. Coming in, like I gave with the miners example, his goal might be to have enough money to buy a house. But for each player in the game, they'll have a different goal depending on where they sit within the social structure to try and reflect the various different motivations that are at play with all different people at all different levels of society. So it'll be individuated different goals for different people in different areas. So my second question, moving quickly on, um, what would drive you to play this? Rivka. <laughs> If it goes a certain time that it's started, um, I know everybody else is playing it, or a lot of people are. Stop, so there's a window, there's a window to play. Yeah, okay. What format is it in? Like, is it digital? Or it's, is no, it's a live action social game where you go to a place, you get given a character, and you're given some practical tools, which I would take me longer to explain what those practical tools are. But if you're a minor, you'll be doing some practical activities producing something, selling it, taking the money that you get and buying other things, forming relationships, engaging in social interaction with other people um, in order to get what you want. So if it was thought as like an event, then the fact that it's an event, a live event, yeah. then I think that would... That helps. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is, it, um, is it open source and free? It will be open source and free, so it's going to be played publicly in May, uh, and then it will exist as an open source game document. Uh, online, which people can download and use on their own. 
So is there always a facilitator or, or is it just pay itself, pays itself? There will be a facilitator and it does need to be facilitated. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so moving on, another question, keep me right on time, Georgie, if I might. You have 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what does this game make you think of in terms of values? Yeah. I, I think you have to be prepared for people really critiquing it. Because my immediate critique of the miner is it's very unrepresentative that's happening in England. There are very few miners left. And secondly, they're kind of climate criminals today. Now, so whatever whatever assumptions you make in this model. You know, somebody is going to critique it very strongly. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you have to be really sure of where you're coming from. So I'll stop you there. So thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Ian. You can come downstairs and I'll meet you downstairs. You're absolutely fine to leave your belongings here. Uh, they will not be left alone.